Right. Welcome everyone to our Covet Club Talks. Here we have with us today our very own Covet artist, Christy Chan, and, <laughs> and her professor from UCL Slade, Andrew Stull, who is the head of the uh, Department for Undergraduate Painting. And it is so wonderful to have Andrew join us today. Thank Thanks so much both. Um, so let's go ahead and, uh, you know, jump right in. Welcome again to our talk. We are here um, to discover some of Christie's works, go through her development, and Christie will be so kind to walk through her travels and uh, her influences, and therefore uh, the talk is called uh, the Transcultural, so which is fantastic. And we will also go through uh, some of Andrew's works uh, and his influences while he's been traveling through his residencies. So quick intro for Christy. Uh, Christy has uh, completed her um, honors degree uh, in uh, painting at Slade and is uh, studying or finishing her master's at Sotheby's in contemporary art. And we are so happy to have her. Andrew um, is, of course, Christie's professor and has uh, won you know, multiple awards and with scholarships has traveled widely uh, on residencies to Asia, um, you know, Thailand, I've seen Sri Lanka and Hong Kong. So it's a wonderful way to talk about uh, our, you know, motion and displacement. So let's, uh, let's go ahead. Uh, I wanted to go ahead and introduce COVID and what we do. Uh, and then we can go ahead, I'll share my screen and then we'll walk through some of the uh, wonderful images and some paintings and it'll be really fun. It'll be exciting to see Christie's new works as well, not only her development and uh, you are welcome to ask us questions. There's a Q&A button right there. So feel free to jump and ask questions. We will cover all of this in 30 minutes or so, and then we'll have a Q&A session. But if you have a burning question, please go ahead and ask away. Right, so I'm Saras. I'm the CEO founder of Cover.Art, and we are here to guide you through the mysterious world of emerging art. So you can experience the joy um, of discovering and championing and investing in a high caliber collectible emerging art. Uh, the art artists uh, are graduates from leading universities and prestigious universities out of the UK. We are very happy to be supported by the mentorship and guidance uh, by the Mayor of London. And we have been uh, um, noted by the Creative Industries Council as wants to watch. So all very exciting. We launched just in June uh, with our debut exhibition, Delineating Dreams, which is online, so go check it out, where we have uh, three of Christie's works uh, and uh, works from seven other artists across media. Right, so why don't I go ahead and share my screen so that you can see this. I hope you're able to see my screen. All good, wonderful. So let's go ahead and jump right in. So this is, this is the work by Christy called Sashimi on the Tube. And this was in our debut show uh, from June. Of course, it's, uh, it's sold now. It's an incredible work um, showcasing Christy's signature gestural style. And uh, you can see the juxtaposition of uh, the people's so characters and usually stolen realities. Uh, you do find a piece of sashimi floating around. Uh, and it's, there are elements of uh, surrealism and our first show is based on that, especially given uh, the times we are in. Um, we, this exhibition, Delineating Dreams, was in response to the seismic shifts in what's happening outside um, and a way for us forward to a way for us to dream and imagine and uh, 
please go and check it out. Uh, hopefully you like the exhibitions on virtual reality. And here you will see that uh, Christy works on hologram-like um, works and her, her brush strokes are incredible. Uh, she absorbs all the stimuli from daily narratives and this is how she showcases and um, transforms uh, a canvas into uh, a magical reality show. So you do see stolen realities here and objects and objects losing its meaning. So I'll jump right in and ask Christy on what she thinks of this work and then I'd love to take you on a journey uh, talking with Christy right from her um, you know, upbringing in Hong Kong and when she moved to the UK and then over, over uh, the next few slides I'd love for Andrew to make a commentary um, and we'll talk about a few influences uh, by some of the masters and the icons uh, and some parallels there and then we'll look at the most recent artworks. Great, so Christy please go ahead. Um, well, for this work in particular, it's called Sashimi on the Tube because I think it was this year. No, this year? Probably a little bit earlier. Um, I was on the Tube in London on Central Line. And then, surprisingly, it wasn't super crowded. And I normally really hate the Tube. Um, but I was on the Tube for no apparent reason. Um, and I just saw like these three people standing in front of me. And I just thought, wow, that pictorially looks really cool. And I really wanted to paint that. Um, just like them standing in their own corners, minding their own businesses. And, and then I caught myself really thinking about sashimi and how I really wanted to get sashimi when I get off the train. So um, that, this is essentially what inspired this painting that I was really wanting to buy you know like a, a wasabi pack of sushi and me seeing these people in front of me and i just thought yeah i'm gonna paint that so yeah that, that is this painting <laughs> can, I ask, can, I, can i ask you whether to show us the sashimi because i'd love to see it oh yeah it's just like on the top right the pink one yeah yeah the pink Salmon. Little bit. Salmon. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's kind of like a it's somewhat of a reoccurring thing, like a salmon, um, which you'll I'll talk about later. Because I and really I love that, and I love that, and I get these cravings of sashimi as well. Um, and and here we see that um, we will see more of Christie's work. We'll jump right back to when Christy. Um, during her high school uh, when she moved from Hong Kong uh, to London what was that journey like so let's go go to one of her earliest works when she moved from Hong Kong to the UK so I've moved around as well uh, yeah. you see you've been you know born and raised in Hong Kong yeah. I've been you know born and raised in India and the whole idea uh, of identity and displacement and um, also in terms of absorbing elements and culture and experiencing these um, Western classics, for example, in flesh for the first time. How yeah. was that? Um, so I didn't actually see this work in person. Uh, when I came to the UK, it was for A-levels, for sixth form. Um, and uh, I kind of went for the fine art course uh, for A levels in painting and the tutor I never actually painted at that point in like 2014 um, and the, the tutor there he was like you know what um, just look at these old masters you'll learn from them um, so I started trying and I was like completely captured by this particular box painting by Cavaggio um, just by how, how calm the painting was um, so I wanted to like kind of recreate that in my own way um, and also, you know, learning how to paint flesh tones and human anatomy and stuff like that, you know, like when you're in high school, all you think about is how to paint academically and how to paint like, accurately to like kind of tick all the boxes, which kind of <laughs> sucks. But um, yeah, and, and so, I, so I got one of my friends to kind of pose for me and I found like little objects around my room as well as the art department, like the Buddha statues and stuff. And I just kind of placed them around because um, also I didn't want to paint 
leaves and grapes. Yeah. <laughs> and I love that. And I love that you use what's around you yeah. and incorporate that into your narrative. Um, so, so let's keep moving to what happened next, right? So you yeah. came to the UK during your A-levels and that's when you were introduced to painting. Yeah. Um, and how was that experience? You, you um, went to boarding school here. Yeah, I went to boarding school. Um, one of the reasons why I really like, stayed a lot in the art department was I really didn't like school in general. I didn't like the, you know, the, the culture of you know, it's really clicky and I really didn't like that. So I stayed in the art department quite a lot, just painting. And I kind of made all the excuses so I can stay in the art department. I'd be like, oh, it's prep time. They were supposed to make, like do homework, but I'll be like, oh, my prep is in the art department. <laughs> and I just like stay there and make my tutor write me a slip that allows me to stay there essentially. So I'm like, yeah. So we kind of established like a really good relationship where I can make work like that. Um, have, you, have you kept your paintings? Is that one still around? Yeah, this one I think is still around. I don't really know where it is, but it is somewhere because I know I have a tendency to paint over paintings and I have not painted over this one. I was just about to say that uh, hopefully you've not painted over this one. Yeah. How big is it? I, I think it's like around 180, 170. But quite quite big for a school painting because one of the things you you know you've you've done very since you went to the Slade is you've made very large work generally yeah. very physical work but we'll talk yeah. about that in a minute yes. yeah um, um, and and I do see that the palette uh, that you've chosen is quite somber and was that reflective of your mood or was that uh, no uh, so this painting is just a picture that I've taken of one of my friends. Uh, house or like her, her flat in London uh, but I, I went to Cheltenham but uh, we were like you know it's turn break and then we go to London and we're like the cool kids who are the misfits and stuff like that <laughs> so those are like one of her flats and um, it was I think it was just before we left so I think you know I think it was like iPhone 4 iPhone 5 so the colors were a bit off and I kind of liked it um, and also, I think back in high uh, back in high school, like my palette was not very bright. It was very like yellow ochre, really burnt umber, really brownish. Um, yeah, so I guess that that was kind of reflected in this. And I remember, you know, you have to like add in the experimental bits. So <laughs> I use like paper mache on the on the blinds, and like wow, it's so three D. <laughs> So cool, that's amazing. And then you did add this particular polka yeah. that uh, we talked about. And why? What uh, what elements did you really enjoy? Uh, um, so, style? yeah, when I was introduced to polka's work when, obviously when I was in high school, um, my tutor was huge on him in a way. And I didn't really know the political context about it during back then, but I just loved um, the use of like mixed fabrics and um, the, the, the experimental uh, values in it. Did you um, see? Did you see his show? Massive show. I think oh yeah, yeah, in yeah, Liverpool. The, yeah. Yeah. Oh, not in Liverpool. I saw the one. Uh, I'm getting it. Maybe I'm confused. But I was, there has been a massive show. Oh. Yeah, because he had a retrospective show probably like 2012 or something, and I think I saw that. Uh, it was like the whole tape was all of his works and it was incredible. Um, but yeah, like, and, yeah. and then I got to know that he, he's really experimental in his paints and he was always really like ironic and really like always things are really tongue in cheek because um, the watchtower has connotations with German countryside for like hunting, but at the same time in the 80s, there's this, um, so like this uh, strangeness about like this, post-war sentiment that it also relates to um, guard towers and concentration camps. Concentration camps. Yeah. Um, so obviously there's like the D standard that kind of reflects hunting and then the, the fabric on the right that reflects like the ready-made um, fabrics and like leisure time with like, you know, ice cream and sunbeds and leisure. And I just find that juxtaposition of 
seriousness and what on earth is going on merged together really interesting and I've been like fascinated about his work yeah that's that's really interesting and exciting and I do see that you love to incorporate some of the you know invented objects or yeah, yeah. Uh, daily objects and they could be out of place and do they lose their meaning do they gain another meaning that's always interesting in your work to see mm -hmm. and here we have uh, an incredible work by Gang Shui. Yeah. And yeah. this exhibition, Andrew, you had curated. Uh, could you tell us a bit more about this show and uh, when Christy sure. went and saw this so work? This, and, this, yeah. This, this was a show um, for, of CAFA, that's the Central Academy of Fine Art, Beijing, and the Slade. And I, with a Chinese curator, we organized. So there were 12, and it was for people that. Um, teach art and make art. So it was for arts, practicing artists who also teach in leading academies. So it was 12 from the Slade, 12 and 12 from um, Kaffa in Beijing. And uh, this was a video. It's quite extraordinary a video. And I'm, I'm sure Christy will tell you more about it. And we had the whole ground floor of the West Wing of Somerset House. It was a, a great, it was a great show, a really big show, really wonderful. Yeah. Oh, I wish I could have made it. I was not in London at that time. But Christy, so you went in and you yeah. said that you were slightly blown away. So tell me more. Uh, so this work is a, it's the first ever made porcelain stop motion. Um, and Gao Shui, obviously, she is from uh, China and uh, she basically. Like she, before she's taught at Kaffa, I, I kind of researched a little bit about her that she went to Germany for an exchange and then she spent an year making all the porcelains and this was her degree show piece for her master's degree at Kaffa. Um, and it's 13 minutes, 23 seconds long. <laughs> and um, it's just incredible. It's about this um, beautiful Chinese folklore that is really, uh, common and uh, really homey in a way uh, that, that everyone has heard of or has read that book. It kind of has like around 500 folklore and tales um, in that book and this is just one of the uh, one of the stories and it's called Mr. C and it, I just like it's so eerie it's it kind of accentuates the, the materiality of porcelain and um, the, the characters kind of communicate by tapping on their body and then you hear um, the, the clinging sound. It's kind of like, like that wow. better uh, of the porcelain and it's incredible and um, yeah, it's just beautiful. And uh, I just find the merger of, you know, Western, in a way like Western art or if you will, like uh, media art with a traditional Chinese form of um, art, which is porcelain, really interesting. It was a wonderful combination, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. West and East. And, and interesting enough, um, Xiao Hui Go, who's the curator, the Chinese curator, told me she was going to participate in the Venice Biennale yeah. representing yeah. China. And unfortunately, because of COVID, um, I think yeah. it's delayed. It's been postponed. Yeah. Postponed, delayed. Yeah. But very incredible work. Definitely. I have to look the video up now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now I'm extremely intrigued and curious. So you have picked this particular Richter that uh, Christy, you felt um, were inspired by. You've seen him talk, is that right? Yeah, so he was the first guest speaker at Slade in my first year. So this was like my first um, lecture that I've ever had at Slade, and he is just in, insane. <laughs> like <laughs> we, were very, we were very lucky because I was organising the contemporary art lectures, and it coincided with Free's art fair, um, which he was in. So he came over anyway to England and um, gave a great talk. And that's not particularly typical of his work. Some of his work's much more romantic and sort of yeah. you know seascape, but it's a I think it's one that, that actually relates, you know, re relates a bit to Christy. Yes, and uh, in, in terms of the, again, the fluidity, the movement, and yeah. what, what about it, uh, Christy, that captures you? 
Um, I think it's the way that he talks. <laughs> I think I think uh, him as a person really adds character to his work. I mean, his works are incredible by itself, and they're huge. Um, but then I remember him just talking about this one particular painting about him standing on the edge, and he was like, "Imagine you being high on LSD, and you're just like looking through the edge, and then you're just like, wow." And I was just like, oh my God, this is crazy. Um, but yeah, like I, I, I've been in love with his work ever since I've seen him talk. And um, I don't really like look at his work religiously as in like, I don't study it religiously, but it's always nice to just like revisit who works just to like, just feel it a, a bit. <laughs> it's yeah. the intensity of feelings then that, yeah. Uh, yeah, that 100%. stands out. And, and uh, Andrew, um, you kindly picked a few works uh, yeah. by Batman, Schmidt, Rotluff, and a few others who you think uh, could be a good parallel to talk about Christie's work. Can you well, tell us more? Well, that, yeah, actually, but the ones that they kind of affected are more the ones that we haven't seen yet, that, in my view, that come afterwards. But one of the, there's a sort of link in Christie's work, I think, with kind of German expressionism. And it's interesting, she's doing a residence in Germany at the moment. And there's something about gesture, sort of figurative, not too much information. Um, there's something about, you know, um, kind of contradiction, the material. Um, yeah, so they're, they're, there's a sort of freedom and wildness about them. And um, they were the, the brook here from very, you know, just after kind of the foes and it was like a big turning point in um, 20th century painting. And an early stage of it, there'd been several stages of expressionism and this was, I suppose, descended from Munch, who was a big influence on people like Kirchner. It's developed throughout the century, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there's a connection. I think you'll see it more when we move on to more of Christie's. Yeah. I, I love, love, love like um, the colors in German Expressionism mm -hmm. and how they frame things. It's so strange and it's so flat and I love it. Like, I, yeah, I just find it really interesting. How they yeah. It. And, yeah. Also, just like, I mean, it's like they're painters that actually that believe that paintings can have feelings. Yeah. You know, and that's what's extraordinary about them. It's not just about appearance. It's, of course, other artists went as well. They're wonderful artists that deal with that, but very particular. And this is a more recent um, yeah. influence, Neo Rauch. Very incredible works. Um, also, another artist that I looked at quite often, he has a few paintings where he completely changed the skin colors of people. Um, and they're like in like green or like orange faces. And that was the point when I started to experiment with not painting figures accurately. Um, I started to give them like strange colored skin or like strange features or enlarged, mm. elongated, stuff like that. Yeah. No, I do see that and I really enjoy it. And I hope, well, I wish I could turn my screen because there is a beautiful Christy <laughs> Chan on the Am other I side of the wall. Um, I saw a message, someone saying that those look like Emil Nolde, I think meaning the previous one. There was a message appeared on my screen, I think it was someone mm -hmm. watching. Oh. And they're right, Emil Nolde was from the same time, you yeah. know, from the early 20th century. And um, they were all connected, all those artists, yes. Not Neil but the ones before. Yes, yeah. absolutely. That's fantastic. Um, so now we'll move on to Slade and Christie's development um, as an artist uh, after all the influences and everything that you were learning and absorbing. So tell us a bit more about this work and then we'll go through a few more as well, Christie. I'll keep scrolling yeah. through so we get to our, your most recent works as well. Yeah, so this painting is three meters by 1.8 meters. So it's quite long. Um, and that was kind of like a departure point where I felt like I don't want to paint figures that accurately anymore, you know, like linking from Rao and all like German Expressionism and all of that. Um, so I tried to recreate the idea of having some sort of human presence 
in the work. And then the more I think about it, I was like, well, I'm like me painting it is a human presence. So really, I'm going to be there. Humans are going to be there anyway. So I just thought I'm just going to like go for it. Um, yeah. So it's called an awkward squat because it, I've been like strangely like, in just strange positions of making the painting because it's so big. Um, and then that kind of paved way for like other bigger works. Oh, that's and wonderful. And that's wonderful because I did see on your Insta account as well, the scale yeah. of your works while at Slade. Also, you probably had the luxury of going all out with the yeah. spaces. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And tell me a bit more about what, what happened here. Okay. Uh, so after the painting above, I started painting about this one because I just suddenly remembered about this one particular painting that my high school tutor has made, which is of a diver. Um, it was like a really blue painting. Um, he was a relatively figurative painter and I loved it. Um, and so I just had that idea in mind, but I was thinking about how would I paint that if I'm not making anything recognizable. Um, so this is what I came up with, essentially. Elephants are poking through the yellow. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> I mean, um, I think yeah. that's something that's key to all your work. It's this kind of mixture of kind of more diagrammatic, more abstract work and figuration. And it's yeah. the palette. And there's a sort of murky quality about it. There's a yeah. kind of, um, I don't know, um, kind of, it's almost like becomes like partly graffiti on it or something. Mm -hmm. Hidden messages. Think yeah. of something Basquiat almost, you know. Mm, yeah, hundred percent. Because like I've also used like spray paint extensively, especially in my second year. Um, used that for a lot. Um, also because I felt like it was like really good way to cover the canvas, <laughs> just like give it a little bit of something before I build on it. Oh, that's so interesting to hear. So now we come to around the time where you presented at the Slate Degree Show. Yeah. Um, when we discovered your work, so I was walking past your work and I thought, this is incredible. Who is this? I need to call her. And we had that phone call and it all started yeah. back then. So yeah. tell me uh, about this work, about Goose Yeah. Goose the Grinch. Okay. Goose the Grinch. Um, so I was painting a lot of bathtubs in my final year because I recently moved to a flat where there's not a bathtub and I was really upset about that, that the toilet was really small. Um, so I spent the whole year of my final year painting about bathtubs and this was kind of like in the middle of um, the last bit of my bathtub phase. Um, so I thought, what if a duck could be a bathtub? And because you know all the bathtubs have like really pretty legs um so i was like okay maybe a goose would work uh and then i started like painting these like strange little fluffy eyes inside the the, the bathtub thinking that it's like kind of like water um and then someone walked past me saying like oh it looks like a grinch um and i was like that's it the goose ate the grinch and that is how this painting came about <laughs> <laughs> at that amazing and then this was the work which was shown uh, at our debut show delineating dreams yes and andrew i'd love for you and christy to explore some of the details oh. there well for me as i was saying earlier there's a sort of immediate freshness you know about her work i, I mean i think uh, sometimes i think of um something like chinese watercolor painting talking about the transcultural maybe an artist like Alex Katz, but as I said earlier, there's something slightly, there's something that goes wrong with them in a good way. There's something like, they're not slick. They're like an argument, like, and then you find that the things emerging, I think they're brilliant. Like you've got this fish on the bottom blue right or whatever it is. And then you notice the finger going down the stairs on the left. There's something, there's always something there, but they, they're not easy. You know, there's something dark in her painting. It's very, very interesting. They're almost sort of Blakeian, you know, in their, in their content. And I, I think, you know, but that, that kind of one brush, the flow, that sort of comes from Chinese painting. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, for this particular painting, I think it's kind of a great way to explore this, like, strange darkness that you were talking about, because it is of, like, 
conflicting feelings. I was on my way to a dentist appointment. I was completely dreading because I hate dentists. Um, and it was like super early in the morning. I was really tired. But then um, I was like, okay, I've got to go because I can't cancel it or else they're going to charge me 50 pounds. Um, so I went there and uh, it was this like beautiful spiral staircase that goes up to the, the, the dentist's office on Euston Road. Um, and I was like, wow, that is insane. Um, and just kind of completely blown away by the stairs. And I was like, okay, I've, I've got to paint this. Um, so I went back to Slade that, that morning, well, by, that, by the time that they've done, you know, drilling my teeth, it be noon, but um, started painting the, the, the railings of the painting. So it's kind of like a mixture of, I kind of hated going there, but then it, in the end, it was like, wow, it was incredible, but not to an extent that is that was worth the pain of you know getting your teeth drilled. But it's kind of, yeah, it's all these strange feelings mixed together. But yeah, I, I was painting the rails and I forgot about the stairs, so I was like, okay, I'm just going to shove them in a the corner, which you can see <laughs> on the left. There is that freedom in your work, and there is a freshness about it, and you know the, the discovery aspect interests me. So you you know, find something new, like I've just seen something for the first time. I might might be wrong. It looks like a sort of snake under the spiral staircase. Is that a fabric? The head, is that a fabric? the head or the arm. Oh. I think it's a part of a railing. I, I originally wanted the, the, the end of the railing to be a person smoking a cigar, but then I thought that was too cartoonish. <laughs> and I kind of like made it into something else. Yeah. But I love that you always discover these new elements when you um, pay closer attention to uh, Christie's works and therefore the whole element about you know, symbolism, that's also quite strong. And yeah, Christie, you went around again, speaking of journeys, travel and transcultural, you uh, went to a museum in Luxembourg yes, um, yes. and looked at this classic. Um, and then what happened? Um, yeah, so a few of our friends from Slade, we decided to go to Luxembourg because there was a huge Yusa Kota show that we wanted to see. Um, and then obviously, if you go to somewhere, you'd obviously go to their art museums. So we went and uh, so we saw this painting and I was just kind of amazed by how strange the bodies were. Um, how this mat, like this painting is really big. Um, again, like Bacchus, Venus and Cupid. The painting is huge and um, Bacchus, he looks like a monster essentially and um, I just how find big, how big is it? Um, probably like two and a half, three meters maybe. Can I ask, uh, can I yeah. ask you something about your process? Yeah. How, how long did you, how many times did you work on this? Was it many, many times or was it done very freshly? Very quickly? Um, this particular painting was actually done very really freshly. Um, I think it took me like a day. I, it took me like, I remember Sunday afternoon and then Monday morning to oh. finish that. Um, and, and that painting, uh, back to that I've always wanted number 15, also my bathtub face. Um, it was, this painting is 250 cm times 210. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to capture that strangeness and that back as to being as to the painting, but instead um, I wanted to make it my own and put them in a bathtub and see what happens. So, <laughs> so yeah, so that, that's kind of what happens. Oddly enough, I start, you know, seeing the Italian influence, but more like Sandro Kia or Clemente, or people yeah. like that, you, uh, you know. Okay. That, kind of and, and someone just uh, commented that they loved your work, Christy, and they do see some influence of German Expressionists. Yeah. So just wanted to put it out there. And now we're coming to your most recent work, which is really exciting to see. Uh, some of these works have been never exhibited before. Yeah. Uh, so thought we'll start with the first one here, which is now being exhibited with a charity show her story uh, with the incredibly important and beautiful charity called Beauty for Freedom, uh, fighting against human trafficking. It's a US-based one. 
Uh, again, it's very important in terms of uh, pushing for values for Black Lives Matter and the whole movement there. So th that's the context in, in, in terms of how we as coverage absolutely encourage uh, some participation in important charities which align with the values. And so what's happening with the lamp lady here, Christy? Uh, and this so is an amazing this is... picture of you in the studio anyways. <laughs> Uh, so recent works are all paintings I made during like quarantine, lockdown, COVID, uh, pretty much, uh, because I was really busy with like uni work up till March. Um, so this painting, uh, I was really tired for some reason. I was having problem sleeping, uh, so my flatmate showed me this um, sleeping droplets from Russia and they kind of like have this little picky thing and then so you kind of kind of see it of me dripping that like in that from the hand dripping that little placebo droplet that's where it came from and the lamp was because i was having a lecture at 9 a.m and i was really tired because of you know what unable to sleep yeah i think there's a real difference in these because i think you're using geometry in a much yeah. more obvious way which is very exciting you know like the Everything, you know, I mean, as we know, as Cezanne said, everything is either a triangle, an arch, or so. Yeah. So I think if we look at that yellow, the yellow trousers, the space between, oh, I can't see it. Oh, sorry, I'm gonna uh, go back. So you're absolutely right. I, you do see There's, um, geometric forms. Uh, well, the, the, the sort of pink hat is actually working like a powerful piece of geometry. The leg. Yeah. Form, you know, and, yeah, and, I think that's right. and also I think the one, the self-portrait that you're painting on the right is very, you know, um, you know, the one there, that is a self-portrait I could see. <laughs> uh, no, it's actually I know. Scenes. <laughs> <laughs> so now moving to your um, really exciting work that you created during lockdown, the cheese fondue, yes. and you see incredible amount of in a detail there, a transition between uh, figuration and abstraction, which is amazing, um, and uh, a use of color. And again, the, your brush strokes, your never ending uh, brush strokes. So, Andrew and Christy, I'd love for you to talk about some of the details there. Uh, the sure. hand, the curious hand that's appearing, what's happening here? Well, for me, this is also geometry, quite. There's a sort of, you know, the hand coming down, the hand thing. But the main thing is that that reference, the very kind of, I'm thinking of all sorts, you know, the, the expressionism, the red hair, the emotion, the tears. For me, it's a very emotional painting, actually. And I know they're eating and I can see the table with the pans on it. I've already had that pointed out. But, yeah. you know, it's the flow, I think, of Munch, actually. I'm mm -hmm. thinking of Edward Munch and um, the star. The other person, who I thought we had an image of was Lee Krasner. Yes, that's coming up as well. Up, yeah, but I mean, you know, it's the chunkiness of the arm and then the flow and the, the color as well. The red, you know, it reminds me of the expression, reminds me of the sick child in Monk. Is mm. it the sick child? A little bit, yes. And in a good way, I love the way you refer to things without in any way, like it seeming suffocating. It's, it's great, yeah, beautiful. Wonderful painting, yeah. And, and when did you paint this, Christy? So that was during lockdown, just Yeah, lockdown? that was also during lockdown. Uh, I was just thinking, you know, I haven't really painted any paintings with more than three figures. So I found this painting of my friends and I having cheese fondue back in February. Um, and there was like around eight people in there. So I was like, okay, I guess this is my challenge. I'm gonna try to put as many figures as I possibly can in there. Um, yes, and we're having cheese fondue. You can see like a tray, a baking tray in the corner. There's like cheese fondue forks that everyone's holding. Um, the salmon pattern on the right, right corner. Here. Yeah, because uh, that is my flatmate. She is allergic to fish and self shellfish and nuts and pine nuts and cashews and very Hello. allergic. Can I ask you, when yeah. you were based in, in uh, Finland for a while, did you go yeah. to the Monk Museum? It's quite a long yes. way away, I know. Yeah, I, I, I did. Um, it was 
like it was actually like a lot smaller than I expected, but at the same time, um, there's like the works are so beautiful, and um, I actually, idea. yeah, I actually got a chance to like go to a few other, um, uh, you know, museums and stuff in Finland because I was not necessarily based in central Helsinki. I was in Gershlinmaki, which is seven hours away from Helsinki. Um, so I went to a few museums in Oulu as well, which is another big city um, in Finland. And I go to Helsinki um, because there are some exchange students I became friends with at Slade and we created a show together as well. Yeah. And I love that you um, curated a show while in Finland as well, which, uh, which we hope to talk about a bit more. So here we have another one called uh, Technically a Self-Portrait Goofy. Yes. Um, yeah, so I found this image of my parents. They love sending me random little pictures of them when they're younger. And I found this picture when they were dating when they were in their 20s and they were in Disneyland and they were taking a picture with Goofy and I thought well if I paint them it's technically a self-portrait of me because them two equals me in a way um so that is why like this is what this painting is about <laughs> did you exist back then when the picture was taken no no you they were dating you said right yeah they were still dating so exciting yeah. and um and also I love that uh, you use uh, humor mm. in many of your works it's uh you know it's the levity of it it's the wry humor is that conscious is um, that a way to fight back uh, i guess it's uh just me being me in a way uh, i find it really hard to be overly serious especially when i'm talking about something that relates to myself or about my work um and i also think there is a lot of truth in being funny because, it, you know, the saying is funny because it's true. <laughs> and I kind of, yeah. Um, that's and your kind of titles what. are funny quite often. Sorry? Your titles are funny. Oh, too, yeah. Like, <laughs> like self-portrait with Goofy, you know. But they've yeah. still got this flow, you know, that's so important to your work. Yeah, thank you. Yes, absolutely. And why is there a neon donut on your friend's head? Um, okay, so this is a painting. My my family and I we were going to this space in Shoreditch because they were saying like, oh, we've got a space for you to like, show some work. I was like, yes. Uh, so we walked from Soho to Shoreditch, and we were just like grabbing food on our way, and I I kind of came across this chicken cottage shop, and I was like, okay, I want some chicken cottage. So on the right, that's me eating chicken cottage. The bag is a bag of chicken cottage and uh, the, the place that we were show, I was showing um, is right next to a donut store, Donut Time. And you know how they have like the neon donut sign um, on all their stores and I decided to put that in the painting. And uh, when my flatmate walked past me when I was painting because my studio is in my flat, um, she was like, why is there a donut on my head? And I was like, well, that's, that's the title of the painting. You should, um, have said, you should have said it's a halo. Yeah, I mean, I was like, yeah, it's Cynthia Hale too, because you're, oh, so holy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and I find that really funny because I think some people see it as a halo immediately and they would give it like a different context. Like I've heard people saying that it looks like uh, people falling in love because there's like this kind of strange light falling down and it's all pinkish <laughs> and then it's kind of like romantic and I was like, well, it's, I guess, um, you know, good friendship with your family is somewhat romantic. <laughs> <laughs> it is, and it is um, one of the most important relationships in your life sometimes. Yeah. The person you go back home to, yeah. um, open the fridge and, you know, share a lovely dinner. Yeah. So here we have some uh, references, um, some influences that uh, uh, Professor Andrew Stahl and uh, you know, our curator as well saw some um, some dialogue there with again Lee Krasner and uh, Willem de Kooning. Well, what's um, interesting to me is there's a whole chain of what's sort of called expressionists. So there was the early ones. Then, you know, we've got sort of Lee Krasner and just even a sort of bulbous quality of it. You know, like a lot of your yeah. figures are kind of mm. like slightly bulbous, voluminous, and not and you know. A, 
and um, yes, and the way that the material, you know, for me, a lot of your work seems to be a fight between the image and the material. They're equally important. And, yeah. and you know, that, that's part of the beauty and part of, you're not afraid to make a mistake. And if you do, you work over the top of it yeah. and that makes it richer. And then you, maybe you make another mistake, you scrape it off and you put more on. And, or you, know, you can stay there, you know? Yeah, or just go, mm, very yeah. like, yeah. And now I was thinking of, you know, as I said earlier, I thought about the kind of 90, 80s expressionists, Kia, people like that. And then Alex yeah. Kapp, who does everything in one go without any fear. You know, and I, I just think there are lots of references, but. Yeah. And I think also, yeah, sorry. Sorry, also with Lee Grasner, like it kind of immediately reminds me of Jackson Pollock's early works mm. because they were together. And um, they were also like all about materiality and like the, the immediacy of painting that I really love. Um, yeah, so like, you know, for me, I prefer Jackson Pollock's earlier works and <laughs> I prefer Lee Grasner's works over. <laughs> Have you been to the show at the Barbican? Um, um, no, I was, haven't. But then I think there was a Lee Krasner's show yes, in Yes, that was Krasner. Yes. Yeah, that, that was and huge. There was Tate was and so Barbican, yes. Yeah, oh, so, so good. Such a Incredible. treat. Yeah. And this is, I think, the last work we have, the most recent one, yes. by Christy, um, painted on a very hot day in London, yes. uh, pretty much a few weeks ago. So well, around a month. I remember happening? it was... 10th of August. It was really, really hot. Uh, I think everyone who was in London felt that. It was like three days of like ridiculously heat, like heated. It was like 30, 35 degrees or something. I bought a unicorn palo pool because I was really hot and um, I was just thinking about how do I paint the feeling of like just being happy when you feel some sort of breeze in this really hot day. Um, so that is essentially what this painting about is kind of like about a feeling of thank you so much. I think, it, I think it kind of reveals how autobiographical your work is because it's yeah. got no people in it. In the no. shutdown, maybe I don't know if you were alone during the shutdown, but it's um, very empty of people. Were you alone? Yeah. Or um, I was obviously with my flatmate, but um, it's uh, during the two months of lockdown, I did not see anyone. Um, and then this was painted in August. So when it was like when lockdown eased and I was seeing like a few close friends, um, but very specific close friends. So mm -hmm. I wasn't seeing like anyone else apart from like two people <laughs> that I knew. No, <laughs> and anyone else was listening. Yeah. Yeah. Illegal parties, illegal no. parties. No. I, I remember uh, meeting a few um, studio mates by Get Slayed. Um, like once or twice at Regent's Park. Yeah, <laughs> but that's about it. So that sounds incredible. And um, so, of course, we're running over by a bit. Uh, of course, if people uh, need to go, please drop in your questions here. Um, you have a couple of comments saying yes. that your titles are really fun and amusing, the narrative and the small details. Uh, is incredible because it makes you discover your work. It's really powerful. Uh, another one that says, if you are interested in buying Christie's work, where do you find them? So these, a select number of them are now up on our website. So you can go, only three of them, and the others will be shown uh, at an upcoming exhibition where we'll announce details soon. But if you want a pre-pre-preview access, then, um, please uh, let us know. We'll give you contact details later, but yes, there are available. All the three works in our previous show, Delineating Dreams, um, have uh, been sold pretty much on the day when we opened. So um, of course, reach us if you're interested. Um, and uh, another question, have you been inspired by Bacon, Francis Bacon? Uh, I have looked at his work. I really like his palette. Uh, I would never say that I kind of use it as a reference, but I have been told that some of my works really, uh, really kind of is similar in a way, or like it reminds people of Francis Bacon. I've Again, a British version of expressionism, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, and it's kind of like dark, it's a bit like grimy. Yeah. 
Can I just point out, just because I'm meant to be doing some stuff now. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. So when, when, if everyone, you don't have to do it now. No, answer the questions. I'm just saying yes. that when well, we can do it now. I think it's important. End, everyone said, yeah, because you said it's the end. And um, no, I, no, no. I want to talk I just about to stop for Christie's works. No, and no, then keep going on the questions. I just wanted to state because you said you can leave now, but I actually think we were going to talk about residences and Absolutely. stuff. Absolutely. So, the most important thing here is that uh, how travel influences you, your stuff, your um, again, your technique to your content, your narrative, and yeah. it's really important and interesting to see uh, Professor Andrew's works um, and the influences you know, here. Uh, can I suggest we finish Christie's questions because there's still quite a few more she's got, I think, yeah. Um, um, let's see. I think, um, I think that's it for now. I've I think there's one. one. Do, I, do I like Cecily Brown? Yes, yes. I do. Um, and can I talk about the transition between you know, my academic paintings, pre-slide, the more polka, more abstract. The transition, um, I think it was just me being upset about me staying static of what I'm doing um you know like uh, you know as I suppose like with everyone who creates you always want like progress in your work or even regress um uh, and it kind of creates a strange dynamic between you and your work and your relationship with your work and um for me I like I get I'm a type of person that I get bored bored really easily um so when when I feel like I'm doing the same thing for more than like I don't know two three months, I'd be like, okay, something needs to change now. So that's kind of where it, like started happening, like the the transition of being like academic, uh, like you know, accurate human anatomy painting into a little bit more loose. Um, it also you creates like more Cecily freedom. Cecily Brown, do you like Cecily Brown? Yeah, I do. I do. He's X Spade as well. Oh, I see. Didn't know that. <laughs> oh, no, yeah. he also moved from across for that one. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Well, thank you there and keep the questions coming. Okay. While we move to Andrew's works and influences while during his travels and residencies and why residencies are extremely important for building an artist's career. And uh, even even when you're established, uh, like Andrew, and you know Andrew has shown his works at um, you know the British Museum and uh, MoMA and uh, several other important institutions, but the the zest for travel and uh, incorporating influences and something that we want to talk about. So Andrew, what what do we see here? Okay, first of all, to say travel is obviously it's not the best moment to go traveling, sadly. Not enough. right now, no. <laughs> But no, I, I, was, I started off doing a Rome scholarship in Italy um, when I left, I left art school and um, you get a wonderful studio and everything. And then I was, I was eventually put in a show that took me to Thailand and I saw this, what Po, this huge Buddha. And I love the change of scale and I'm gonna speak very quickly because of time. The detail in the foot of the Buddha. And then I, I came across later uh, an, in a newspaper, an advert for the Wingate Scholarship, which then it was, are you an artist, a poet, a writer? Is there a place of your dreams you want to go to? And I'd heard there were lots of amazing Buddhas in the area. So I applied and I got it and I had three months traveling around Burma, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam. This was 1990. The image below, the next one, should we go to? The big Buddha here. Can we go up? higher can we go you can see even higher so it's the center of the screen we go there you see the little people down there isn't that at the bottom isn't that absolutely extraordinary anyway just to come across this you know i i just like i thought there's something about the solidity of the body and also the other thing about traveling is how weird your body is the solidity so if we move on now to the next one the next image we can. Okay, I started making, uh, I made, when I was traveling, I had a space to make work in, in Bangkok and I started making drawings, which in England I turned into paintings. And um, 
the thing that interests me were the thoughts, the little details on the foot of the Buddha that interest me. Things I'd seen, planes that seemed to fly everywhere, stars, fountains, delicate, beautiful jars with colored like that pink thing, and these gigantic heads. Let's move to the next one, shall we? Also, the next one, I saw this in Cambodia. I, there, was some, a, there was somewhere called the Silver Pagoda, which is now not accessible. It was in the royal palace there. But then it was all open. Pol Pot was still in the jungle, whatever. And, um, you know, he wasn't in control, but in the jungle. But you, everything was sort of broken apart. And there was this amazing silver pagoda that looked like a rocket. And again, I put little things, there was little things around it, thoughts. And, um, yeah. And there's, I just had a baby, so my <laughs> wife so was a baby there. So just thinking, little autobiography. And then this next one coming up is called The Kiss, okay? Now, oddly enough, I got a second scholarship to Rome, but I was thinking about the Buddhas, but um, the thing about it was nobody could afford their own housing in Rome. So everywhere you went in the Borghese Gardens, there were people kissing behind pots and trees, the young people, you know, so it's called The Kiss. And again, it's a focus on a part of the body, like in the Buddhas, you can only see part of any part of it. Okay, next one. And you can see like someone cuddling in that little pot. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're a couple kissing. And that's yeah. what you You'd be walking along and yeah. you, you'd see, you'd turn, look at some ancient statue and behind it would be a couple hugging each other. Okay, another residency I did. And I think residence is so good for like shaking up the Western narrative. I mean, I remember being told that, you know, shadows were invented in the Renaissance. And then, you know, I went, when I went to Beijing, I saw this beautiful scroll, actually Guangzhou. I saw this beautiful scroll. And in it was a couple under shade, under a tree. And I, and I looked at the date, it was sort of 880. I thought, oh dear, it wasn't invented in the Renaissance way before. But what interests me, if you zoom out a bit, actually, you can you, okay, well, that's okay like that. You can see that the way the Chinese Scrolls. It was so long, you know, this was like 50 meters long, 100 meters. And so you walked along it and you saw, um, you could see the emperor getting off on different parts of the river. So it was time based, you know, it had a flow and a flow of thoughts. And also other things about Chinese scrolls. You look at the figures on the right in the bigger version, they're almost the same size as the ones in the front. They don't have this weird perspective that we develop. You paint things that you know. It's like, Thoughts. Okay, next, next. So the influence now of this. Okay, so the next painting, I think, coming up. Yes, was a kind of response to scrolls. It's about six meters long, and, or more, seven meters. And it's um, for the death of Trotsky. And again, painting thoughts. Okay, so little things I thought, like the little objects, little scrolls, little fountains. There's a computer on the right. And it's called the death of Trotsky because Trotsky got murdered on the table while he was typing. But I feel computers these days and all the apps are going to kill us all. <laughs> yeah. And here we are doing it on the computer, which is I'm very grateful. For. <laughs> feel that, feel that. Uh, I'm feel the contradiction. <laughs> yeah. Next, please. That was 2014. And it's tons of, by the way, I'm just showing fragments of my work. Tons of work. Just work that really got, was indebted to residences. This is a big show I curated, in, and the date is wrong. It's not 2020. I don't know why. That maybe I wrote it wrong. It's 2015 or 16. Thank you. And, no, 17. And it's a huge scroll that I made, I think 23 meters long. And I was curating the show. And uh, this is um, a, called the Bangkok Art and Cultural Center. And I organized a show with Thai, British, um, ba Bengali, and Japanese artists. And it was really exciting and um you know and it, i i would get i get some of the other artists to do a little drawing along it again it's the idea that you'd walk along the flow okay so influenced by scrolls quite obviously next one okay this was another residency because of that show i i got invited to do like my third residency in thailand the first one was in chiang mai and i got given this this studio in chinatown and it was so amazing I had somewhere to sleep, I had everything. Anyway, so this is one painting. I was thinking of Rome fountains, but also flow. See, there's a bit of a red thing behind me up yeah. there. 
I was actually thinking of to make a match. Is that right? That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Now what happened was I was struggling with this painting. Yeah. And then I thought, oh, I'm so angry. And I just picked a bucket of red paint, chucked it on it, drew on it. It all went, all came together. And that painting is in a museum now in Bangkok. Yeah. Amazing. So next one, please. I hope we're nearly there. I don't want to keep it too long. Should we go to the next? Mm. Can we speed up a bit the process? Because yeah. I'm getting a bit worried about how it takes longer for me to come up than me to talk. Um, Sorry, this one, uh, because of screen share, Andrew, unfortunately, I'm scrolling fast, but because of screen share, there's a bit fine. of lag. Yeah. Don't worry, don't worry. I'm, I'm, I'm teasing. I get worried I'm talking too much. <laughs> this is called Samui Thoughts. Again, the head is to bring the viewer into it. I went to Samui on, on this res same residency as the one before, and my my wife and my kids and the sea was so beautiful and I was thinking about things there were planes and everything the sea basically the islands the strange clouds that are like islands anyway that was in the show too again I, I enjoyed pouring the blue pouring the green yeah okay next please there we go you see this work right here there we go. I love don't how work. you like add don't to work. a person's I, face in it to like give people an entry point that you can relate and like go into the work easily. I can't hear you I actually. Oh. Um, I was saying how I love how you kind of put a head in like certain bits and it's like kind of a fragment of a head but you can recognize it and it kind of makes it more humanly and it kind of gives you an entry point into the painting. Yeah. Right. And it's just part of a show that the residency was out in the show in Yenakart Villa. That's just part of it. We can go up. Mm. That's fine. That's fine. It was a solo show. There was lots of small work, lots of big work. It just gives a few. It was an amazing space. Now this, oh, the one, below, the one is one above it. We've missed one. My favourite. Sorry. The scroll yeah. is acting Astro a little bit. Fragility. Give me one second. There we are. Bit more down, yeah. Still more down has to come. Yes, this this was commissioned by um, commissioned by the Sharjah Art Foundation in the UAE for a big solo show I had with like 120 works, and I just went round. One thing interests me: went round to all the the local supermarkets and things, and the rubbish bins, and I collected stuff, and their dolls on it. Rather like the scroll painting, you move in and you find things. You can find a camel. The desert was all around this place. You can find a doll. You can find, I found that on the road. You can find a little helicopter. You can find plastic bags and plenty of coffee cups that I drank while making it. Anyway, yeah. I, I, again, it's again, it looks, to, as you go in, you can say, oh, you start to see things. Yes. And boxes which were abandoned in the Shah Jarrah mm -hmm. Foundation. So I built this thing up. I think that's my favorite sculpture. And I've always made sculpture and painting together. Okay, next one. Now, ironically enough, this one takes us back to Hong Kong because I did a residency in Hong Kong in November and it, it actually had to close down because the riots, they shut the university and I meant to be going back, but I couldn't because of COVID, but I hopefully I'll go back in the future. And that was all stuff I found in the area around the university and, um, there was a wonderful toy shop, so if you go close, there's, and it was secondhand everything. Uh, if you go close, there's a little doll on the right with a green and red shirt. But anyway, I, I you know, I, I did that and I made lots of other work there. And I was there for five weeks and it was wonderful. Yes, you can see it better. As you can even see, if you zoom in, you can see some drink cans, you know. <laughs> so I quite like that. And then the next one, um, I made actually before then, that, I was in the Somerset House show. It just happens to be in my studio at the moment. Um, so I had to repair something. Um, and um, it's, um, yeah, 2018. And again, it's a head bringing us in, thinking about the sea, the beauty of uh, Southeast Asia. I love Southeast Asia now and Hong Kong and, um, imaginary and again that's my daughter thinking about her future she's just gone to university this was before she went she literally went three days ago and starts on monday and it's like 
oh my God, you know, I've got my <laughs> life ahead of me. And the sky was beautiful, stars, moons, you know, it's so beautiful. And it doesn't think he looked like her, but it's a simple. <laughs> it's incredible that both of you use memory, archives, and uh, your, ob your emotions, but also objects and people close to you. Um, yeah. And like Christy mentioned, inviting you to investigate further, look at the details and wonder what's happening there. Um, so I really appreciate uh, you, Andrew, walking through your incredible work. With that, we have come to the end of cool. our presentation. Any final few questions, thoughts? I agree anyone? with what you said, by the way, with the link with Christy, because I think we both yeah. actually describe our life a bit. And at the same time, we're very interested in the abstract and the formal and the quality of paint and, and the, the joy. I mean, I don't know, do you listen to music, Christy, when you work? Always. Me too, <laughs> always. It's a joyful activity. I have yeah. to have music. I yeah, got in such trouble at the slave when I was a student there, by the way, even though I didn't walk in the building for 20 years, because yeah. I got mm -hmm. taught to turn my music off. Yes. Well, it's kind of great that, you know, right now you can use like earphones and then now you don't kind of, like, yeah. Yeah. And then you could just go like kind of dance to it and then just paint while you're doing it. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I also love the fact that, you know, with, with especially Andrew's sculptures, um, when you like walk around them, especially the one that I saw in Somerset House, like I just, I was like, why is there a dishwasher's little bit where you put the cutleries in? in there and I just find that so fun and like it's all about you know exploring the little bits and also trying to figure out um how do you relate to what is presented to you because I mean obviously we're we're making works that represent our lives and how we see it but then obviously you also have like other people have different um connotations of what that represents to them and I find that um relationship really interesting and uh, i also saw um a question about if i've never been to ireland uh, i should go to the national gallery um i would love 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 to do that and um, speaking of ireland um <laughs> there's actually uh, I, I actually painted a painting about hula hoops which is a type of chris and i realized that it's actually from ireland and i realized that there's a tato park in Ireland, which is a theme park. For you know, can I just interrupt a sec? Because I'm yeah. really worried about the time. Yeah, you know what's so amazing is you're doing two residents. You're doing one at the moment. You've got another one coming. Yes. You know, residences are so important for artists because they yeah. take you away from the usual things that bother you. You know, your letters, your posts. Your, now, unfortunately, we have email now. But, you know, those things you have to do. They take you and they put you somewhere. Anyway, can you say something about your residences? You're going. Uh, yeah, so I'm in one right now. I'm not in there at the moment. I'm in Hamburg, but I've got a residency in Leipzig uh, for the next three months. Um, I'm very excited. It's going to start in October. Um, I've always, you know, enjoyed German art, so I thought it would be really interesting to put myself in the German art scene, um, which I will do again um, in. Next year, April, I've got another residency in Berlin, and um, I'm also going to Chile for Chile a month. Yeah, exciting. <laughs> in March, um, also for a residency. Um, and I've never been to South America, so I think that would be super interesting. Yeah, that yeah. would be so Someone exciting. Asked me a question, by the way. Yes, yeah, so uh, can't beat a pack of tato. That's yes. what people say. That's amazing. Uh, thank you, you <laughs> know. Um, and uh, with that, uh, with Christie's exciting plans coming up with travels and residencies, of course. Uh, but everybody, stay safe. Travel where you can. Get inspired if, where you can. And uh, visit museums and uh, come to us. Come to Cover Art. Go to Instagram. Go to our account and our website, explore more works. Um, and with that, I wanted to wrap it up with a big thank you to Professor Andrew Stahl and uh, Aunt Christy for your time and for walking us through your incredible work. So inspiring, um, especially on a dull gray day like this in London. Uh, so uh, any final thoughts and then we can wrap it up. Can I just say one thing? I didn't answer Archie Irvine, but oh, it's yeah. very, a very, very difficult question. Um, 
uh, the sculptor has an imaginary scale that takes to another place, you comment on this, that would be great. Well, I really don't know how to comment, but my work's sort of all over the place and does refer to things in other. I'm very interested in imagination, as is Christy. But that's why she has a face inside the, what's it called? The, you call it the G. What? You know, you had the, this pool with the face. Oh, the pool with the Oh, the goose in the Grinch. Yeah, yeah. So I think that idea of that, you know, it's all fairy tales, imaginary, but it's also real. I think it's a yeah. mixture of the two that is so exciting. And uh, thank you so very much for inviting me to talk about Christie's work. It's been a great pleasure. She's amazing. I'm, I'm really... <laughs> and you know, thank you for agreeing to speak to me, and it's been super <laughs> fun. Yeah. And, and, yeah, it's very exciting. And thank, and thank you, Sarah, too, for your, your yeah. great questions. And, thank yeah. you so much. Thank you so much again, Andrew, Christie, and everyone for joining us. Um, have a lovely evening, and this talk will be recorded, and we can share the link with you once you're all ready. Thank you and awesome. have a lovely evening. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.